we'd like to take it up with our next panel discussion now, which talks again about connectivity, rather more so of the dialogue. The topic is the importance of interfaith dialogue. So this is more of a conversation which would be uh, conducted by Imam uh, Muhammad Tahidi. I'm going to invite him to join us on the stage. He's a third generation Iranian born Australian Muslim Imam and a uh, publicly ordained Islamic authority. So we'd like to welcome him. He, uh, he shared his experience of transition into a reformist, uh, which has become a national bestseller in the, in the first six hours itself. Uh, he's also earned uh, the nomination for the 2019 Australian of the Year Award for International Activism Against Islamic Extremism. So we're honored to really have him here. Very warm welcome to you, sir. In conversation with him, let me first invite in Mr. Rajiv Malhotra, who's a founder of the Infinity Foundation to pursue philanthropy, research, and public service at the age of 44 years by taking early requirement. Um, some of his focal points of his work are the interpretation of dharma for the current times, comparative religion, globalization, and India's contribution to the world. Along with them, let me also please invite uh, Mr. Vishwa Adluri, was a professor in philosophy department at the Hunter College, New York, an expert of ancient Greek and Indian philosophy in Mahabharat. His work focuses on the reception of uh, ancient uh, thought, both Greek and Indian, in modernity. So I'm going to leave it to the gentleman to do the task. Over to you, Imam Saab. Is this, can you hear me? Yeah, thank you all for coming uh, to attend this very important conversation, a conversation between uh, Islam and Hinduism, which is uh, a, a very timely, very important conversation to have. Uh, I'm honored to, to moderate this session between uh, Imam, the Imam, and uh, of course, um, Mr. Malhotra, whom you all know. Uh, just to set this conversation up, uh, there is this view that somehow uh, religious intolerance uh, it defines religions. So all we can say about Islam is uh, into the intolerant portion of it. All we can say about Hinduism is the intolerance portion of it which I think is absolutely um, ridiculous, given that these are faith systems that are very essential for everyday lives of all of us. So um, let's get the conversation going from, uh, uh, from the Islamic side and from the Hindu side. I will begin this conversation with uh, Mr. Malhotra ji. Uh, what do you think is the central issue here? Namaste. Can you hear me? Yeah. Namaste. It's wonderful to be here. I want to start by saying that uh, Imam Tawidi ji and I have known each other now for quite a while. Last year we've had numerous private conversations uh, and uh, planned a few activities which will bear fruit later on. So uh, we are in sync on lots of issues and I'm delighted that we are sharing this stage. Uh, just to uh, respond to the question on what are the issues, uh, what I would like to uh, suggest to Imam is, uh, you know, Hindus have no problem offering mutual respect, which says, I respect you, even though you, I don't practice your faith, but I want you to respect me. But the issue I have come across in other interfaith and would like your opinion is that somehow being branded kafir puts us at a disadvantage in any such conversation. And the idea that if I worship in form, I'm considered an idolater, and so on and so forth, one can come up with a long list of such uh, obstacles and these are so my question is are these because they are in the Quran or is the Quran being misinterpreted 
And is it possible for the Muslim community to today to reform itself on its posture towards Hindus in these matters? Greetings. Greetings yeah. and uh, peace be upon you all. Firstly, it's my absolute pleasure to be here in India. It's uh, been long overdue. Thank you. Thank you. And I really hope that this is just the beginning of all the good we can do together and the peace we can spread and peace we can establish. So I thank you all very much. Uh, I am absolutely delighted to share the panel with the both of you, my dear brothers. In order to answer your question, I would need to take a step back into the nature of the religion itself. Islam brands itself as an Abrahamic religion. And Abrahamic religions from the very beginning have always rejected idols. Along with that, we need to keep in mind, and I am Arab, therefore I can say this with some authority, the Arabs without a religion are troublemakers. Without a religion, their culture was very hard to deal with. So now we've got a religion and with so many schools of thought within this religion, everybody who is human is trying to interpret the words of God. This is where we find that Everybody is trying to interpret something based on their own desires, based on their own politics, based on their own fantasies. I do understand that you might have difficulties because you are branded kafir, which means disbeliever. But if you take a look at every other religion, I think that is very common. The Christians look at both of us and say, you're not going to be saved. So, in other words, we're also kafir, disbelievers in their books. I think in order for us to achieve peace, is to first understand that we are both human beings before we are religious people. What makes us good is the fact that we're human. I respect you because you're a human being. If you were an atheist, if you were a Christian, I would still love you because I love that humanity in you. So you, my, my idea is that religion came to serve humanity, to enhance that humanity and allow us to live that humanity. And basically that's what I wish to preach, the, the human aspect of it. If I can accept you as a human and you can accept me as a human, then there's no need for me to change you in order for me to accept you. And that's why interfaith succeeds, when we both agree to be who we are and still live in peace. Yes, so we as individuals have no problem. And you express your personal faith very nicely. But there's also a, an official doctrinal institutionalized Islam, very formally uh, organized, the Sunni side, the Shiite side, and so on. So if you were to address the same question, not from a personal faith point of view, but from the point of view of the world of Muslims, which is a very large community with a lot of institutions. So how would you address it from their point of view in terms of the abil their ability to offer mutual respect to people like us and to reconsider their idea of a kafir because, and to reconsider the idea that Darul Islam, the nation of Islam, supersedes all man-made countries and therefore demands loyalty over overarching the loyalty to their local country. And that is the uh, pr principle of Al-Qaeda and ISIS. And, and you know, even in the previous uh, centuries, India has been a victim of a huge amount of invasions based on that pr premise. So yes, you and I have, are fine. But what about the rest of the people, which is like the most, most of the people out there? I think the, the easiest way to untangle all of this is to try and point a finger at a group that really hates both of us. Okay. So if we take a look at the Saudi Arabian or Pakistani brand of Islam, I'm Muslim, but I don't belong in Pakistan. 
I'm Muslim, Shia, I don't belong in Iran. So I think they don't like me, let alone liking you. So definitely they're not going to like me. All right. Whereby, if me and you were to walk down a street in Dubai, or to walk down a street in Kuwait, or the Sultanate of Oman, which are countries that are formed by a Muslim majority, Muslim rulers, Muslim majority, the same beheading in Saudi Arabia is frowned upon in Oman, in Dubai, in Kuwait. So clearly, not only is there hope for the Muslim nation, but there is a living reality of peaceful, tolerant Muslim societies only because they don't function based upon a Islamic theocracy. So I think the majority of us here can establish this idea that Muslims are neighbors, neighboring countries, but they disagree with each other when it comes to applying laws onto other human beings. Dubai, for example, builds temples, it builds synagogues, it builds churches with Muslim grants, with Muslim money grants. And you know the significance of the Muslim treasury in every country, the Baytul Mal, when they give. Um, I think for us to answer the question as to how are we going to be accepted by the extremist, I don't want the extremist to accept me. I'd be very worried if the extremist accepted me. In fact, I'm honored that they will not accept me. So uh, the way around this is to have a strong security and to live your life peacefully with the Muslims who are peaceful in Dubai and Oman and Kuwait and so on and so forth. Because I like to be very realistic in these issues. I'm, never gonna, I'm not going to waste 10 years of my life hoping the Mufti of Mecca is going to be a human being. He looks human, but if he doesn't want to act human, I'm not going to waste my life. I move on. Plenty of other communities willing to accept a reform of their societies and their communities, and that's what keeps me going. Wonderful. So, you know, this is what I like because he's so clear, honest, outspoken, no mumbo jumbo, and that's what we need because Thank then you. we can have good conversation. So, you pinpointed the target, and of the two places you pinpointed, Pakistan is of special interest to us because they're always after us on our case. So, if you were to diagnose Pakistan's Islam and its hatred for India, which is very intense. Besides the fact that Jinnah wanted a country that he could rule, so he wanted to create this divisiveness, and besides the fact that the British always had this divide and rule, those guys are gone. It's been 70 whatever years that those guys are all gone, but the hatred continues from their side. Is there something peculiar about their brand of Islam and is there some way that we can, you know, you, you said we should not deal with those guys because there's no hope. But in our case, unfortunately, we have a huge border. So we need some way to deal with them. Any thoughts you have? As you know, I'm a big fan of Pakistan. <laughs> um, I'm a big fan. I'm going there for my honeymoon. <laughs> I'm joking. Uh, I have always said this. Every country has an army, except Pakistan, the army has a country. <laughs> so. And this in itself basically explains the whole problem. An army that wants to govern a Muslim community they need to justify everything they do with the book. This book could be the Bible, could be the Torah. As long as people believe in that book, they will use that book. If the people believed in the American Constitution, they'll use it. They don't mind. The point is, what works in that area? It's the Quran. They will use it. If you gave me a violent verse in the Quran, I'll give you 10 from the Bible the Old Testament. The issue is not an issue of verses. The issue is an issue of interpretation. And throughout time, interpretations of the same verses have always changed. Why? Because they interpret based on their own culture, based on their own needs, 
See, that's Pakistan doing this to us right now. <laughs> Based on their own cultures and needs, they do these things. They interpret. And it's not in Pakistan's interest or its army that India thrives and grows. And therefore, they try to identify the neighbor as this evil monster that should never be dealt with. Whereby many governments who are Muslim would be honored to have India's embassy as the first embassy. They treasure and value the relations with India. The problem is, it's their choosing, you know. Them rejecting you is their way of saying that, look, we are not worthy of dealing with you. And you said that Jinnah established a, a country and he, you know, he's gone and therefore the hatred should be gone. No, 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 no. He established the hate and it remained. It was a bad idea that worked out perfectly. So let's just have this point very understood before I pass the mic on to you. Let's not make it seem as though Pakistan was, was a good plan and you know something wrong went, uh, happened. No, 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 it was a bad idea from the very beginning and it worked out really well. That's one thing we need to understand, thank you. I have a question about interpretation. So what guides Islamic interpretations today? Of course you've shown that culture is not a good guide by which these texts ought to be interpreted. Islam had the falsafas, they had Aristotelianism, they had uh, Platonism, they had a whole philosophical tradition. Can that be revived to a philosophical register so that we could promote a dialogue that goes beyond, this is your culture, this is my culture, and we just hate each other? I think the issue is uh, way it's, it's a lot greater than just that. You can't just say Islam. Right. Because I wish there was just Islam. Right. We right. can solve everything easily. There are in fact two major Islamic denominations. And from those, there are 73 Islamic schools of thought. Most of them have different jurisprudence, different understanding of the Prophet, different characteristics of God. We don't all agree on one interpretation, just like in Christianity, just like in every other religion. There are different schools of thoughts. But in order for us to have this discussion, we need to point the finger at the two major denominations, so the main Shia and the main Sunni. So let's, for example, say Iran and Saudi Arabia. These are the main prominent two uh, theocracies that represent those brands of Islam, although many Muslims don't believe that Saudi Arabia represents them. The point is, for argument's sake, we'll say that that's Sunni Islam and this is Shia Islam. What interprets the Quran is the clerical system, the clergy, who use history, who use language, who use philosophy. There is a historic interpretation of the Quran. There's a philosophical one. There is one based on hadith only. There's a cultural one. There's a political one. So the interpretation of the Quran, when we say, there are at least a thousand interpretations out there. At least a thousand. And the more we have technology, the more we have, you know, the, the printing press, the more interpretations emerge, uh, the more we have, uh, you know, the ability to write and produce and, and fund, the more interpretations emerge. So what, what produces Quranic interpretations are these scholars, those who have reached a level of ijtihad in Shia Islam, a level of being an alim in Sunni Islam. And they are the ones who are ordained by their superiors. So to answer your question in short, it is the scholars that interpret. Okay, thank you. Is there, in your opinion, is there need for something equivalent to the Christian Reformation in Islam? Do you feel that it would be a good idea for Muslims internally to consider something like a Reformation movement? A reformation of Islam will never happen, it will never take place. Simply because all Muslims believe in only what comes from God. A, a reformation would be man-made. Therefore, it will never be successful. 
And I am completely against reforming religion because it's a waste of time. You will have 500 people believing in it. That's like one, a soccer club, football club, 500 people. That's nothing. You're not going to achieve any change when you change the minds of 500 people. It's not going to work. And plus, what are you going to be reforming? A book? Two books? Ten books? In Arabic? A lot of Muslims don't read the Quran. They don't even know Arabic. They're not even Arabs. So I, I like to approach things realistically. I think it's more of a, an issue of society, an issue of communities. And I've given these examples of Dubai and, uh, and Oman and Kuwait. They don't behead. They don't stone. They don't kill. You know, in fact, they have laws that are very similar to India's laws, very similar to the West as well. It's an issue of society. Again, I say, if someone was to give me a verse from the Quran that they think is problematic, I can bring them more verses from any other religion. But the Christians don't behead people. Even the most extreme of them don't behead. Why? Because their society has changed. Their culture has changed. Their culture no longer accepts that. The book stays the same. You can find that in all libraries, in all universities. But it's the, the individual that has changed. That's exactly what, what, what I see is the problem. But you know, there was a time in Christianity when they did behead and they burned people at the stake. And uh, bishops had powers similar to fatwas. And they did have a reformation. So it was not just 500 people in a soccer club, but they reformed. And Christians and Europeans would consider that reformation was a major factor in the rise of Europe, the rise of science, you know, bringing, separating church and state. So in their case, it worked. But it take, took over 100 years of violence, civil wars within Europe, a huge price to pay. So it's not, so I, I would say in that instance it has worked. Maybe in the case of Islam it's not necessary or might not be possible. In the case of Christianity, it was not that they amended the Bible, but they reinterpreted it between the Protestants, Catholics, and various other denominations. And this reinterpretation was significant enough that it changed, it was a top-down change of society rather than society itself changing. Uh, correct. Christianity, went through the Reformation after a, quite, a, quite a bit of time. Islam, if you want to take a look at it today, is only 1,400 years old. Secondly, Christians don't believe that every word in the Bible is from God. Therefore, they can have the Old Testament, the New Testament. My neighbor tells me she has a very good Bible. I don't know what a very good Bible is. What's, the, what's, what's wrong with that one, the other one? This confuses me and it would every other Muslim. Right, so there is no one concrete book that can never be changed that's transmitted orally in Christianity. From a realistic point of view, Christianity can, the, the, the Bible can be amended, can be reformed, they can do whatever they like. Muslims can't because it's man made. Uh, that's, the, that's the difference. So I think the way forward is to push a narrative of being pro life, pro human, pro democracy. And it's very easy. Let's not be very close-minded and saying, oh no, Muslims only want theocracy. That's not true. You know, the, the uh, Muslims in Iran, the majority of them would love for America to come tomorrow and take over. You know, these Pakistanis that say death to America, you give them one ticket to America, they will kill each other over that ticket. You know, let's be very realistic. And I, I honestly believe that it's, it's not an issue of, uh, of reformation. I think it's the individual. What if we, we, we disappeared and another group came and they did the same thing over and over? We don't want to be going in a circle. I have a question for you, a slight modification, because what we um, attribute to Christianity through reformation, that Europe reformed itself, and because of the religious reformation, uh, Christianity changed, is a narrative that is not completely true. It's a narrative they push. Uh, but due to colonization, due to economic factors, due to the development of science, what we now call reformation is not a religious phenomenon. It is just a question of progress in Europe. 
So in Islam, uh, what kinds of things should happen so that that kind of progress would come about? The very important and missing piece in Islamic society that needs to be introduced is the ability to criticize and the ability to read whatever you want to read and the ability to speak freely. If the nation is allowed to speak, allowed to criticize, allowed to write and publish whatever they like, you'll be surprised what they will be writing. You'll be absolutely shocked and inspired as to what this community, this religion or this nation in Iran can offer in music, in art, in tolerance, in science and research. So the door to all of this is the ability to speak. If you don't let me speak, you'll never allow me to progress in, sci in scientific research, in academic research, to even say my opinion, be who I am. I have to be who the Ayatollah wants me to be because you won't let me speak. So the first step is freedom of speech and the freedom to criticize. That's the first step that needs to happen in Muslim societies. So taking your idea forward, that the change has to come from society rather than a top-down reformation. Correct. I, and I like that. Do you feel that one of the strategic changes would be to dramatically upgrade the, the role of women, educate women, empowerment of women, because isn't one of the problems with Islam a highly masculine dominated society, masculine, you know, the whole Abrahamic tradition is full of male prophets and so on. All, all of them have had that. But in Christianity and, and Judaism, to, to a large extent, they have introduced a powerful role for women. Do you feel that more women in power as theologians, as clergy, as uh, muftis, uh, running schools, uh, you know, having advanced degrees would alter Islam in a serious way? I was the first Imam in Australia to call for a female mufti for the Australian National Imams Council. Good. And thank you. And I got into a lot of trouble, but it's okay. But let's be a bit realistic again. I like being realistic. I revolve all my talks around a realistic approach. The history of Islam is full of women. For example, Aisha, the wife of the Prophet, regardless of what people may think of her, she had a role of leadership. She even led battles. She conquered. She gave jurisprudential views and opinions. The other wives of the Prophet also had roles after his death. The wives of caliphs were known orators. Pick any book of hadith today, uh, a book of Islamic scripture, you will find that there are women that have contributed to the spread of Islam until today. So I think that there is a, a, a way that's paved for women to become leaders in, in this religion. Where I would agree with you is that Islam, and I've said this before, is a religion of men. Because it came down to a society led by men. And at times you can't really blame the people for being backward. I mean, if someone's a backward minded and you wish to guide them, you don't point out and say, well, you're backward. And here's what you have to do. He doesn't know he's backward. You take a look at the extremists today. The extremist doesn't know he's an extremist. He thinks you're the extremist. He wants you to be like him. Whenever I look, part of my job is to sit with extremists and debate them and talk to them. They try to change me. Because they think I'm the problem. So an extremist will never admit that he is wrong. And the same way with Arabia, the same way with the current issues in Saudi Arabia, right? And I honestly think that culture has everything to do with it. 
because, you know, I'll give you a quick example. The women in Saudi Arabia wear burqas. Why? Because society and the culture there tells them you have to cover your body because men will come after you. You are showing your bodily figure, blah, blah, blah. The same burqa, if she walks in Baghdad, they will think she's a prostitute. Why are you covering your face? Are you hiding something? In Saudi Arabia, she does it because she wants to be modest. That's the narrative, yeah? Modest, whatever that means. You know, because the funny thing is, the husband makes his wife wear the burqa, then he comes outside, he looks at all the blonde, blue eyes women. I've, it's a matter of culture for me. I have a question for Ms. For Rajiv G. Uh, you know, due to colonization and due to uh, your continuing European influence, not just as economic systems, but also in terms of uh, guiding the interpretations of texts. You've done so much work in Indology, for example. Each one of you, can you please tell me uh, what role Europe continues to play in either hampering the self-determination of Islam today and Hinduism today? So it's not uh, Europe, but I would say the West, okay. because the United States, the empire moved across the Atlantic okay. after World War II. So um, I think the West in general, led a lot by the United States, has continued to play a very important role in the way India studies itself through an army of sepoys. These are Indians who are beholding to them, they get their visas, they go there, they get their degrees, grants, uh, they, even the ones who've never been there, they're certified by those who have been there. So there's a whole system uh, of foundations, grant-giving organizations, uh, journals in the West that are about us, conferences and so on. And this is the in infrastructure, the intellectual apparatus by which knowledge is produced. And given the inferiority complex of a lot of Indians, unless you've been published there, you're, it's not considered credible. And if you are certified there and invited there, then you are, you, you are one up. So the power of the West is exerted to some extent because of their infrastructure, their budget. They have excellent libraries. You can do a lot of uh, research there on our texts sitting there. But also, to a large extent, our own vulnerabilities being some of pe some people are sold out as sepoys. Some have not quite sold out, but they have a deep inferiority complex. So the West continues to exert all this stuff. Besides this mechanism, which is controlled there, the categories by which we are studied have been defined by them. So, uh, and we've accepted those categories. Right. So for instance, I have a project called Sanskrit Non-Translatables, which is to convince people of certain Sanskrit words which should not be translated into English. And even if, you, if I'm an English-speaking person, I should use that particular Sanskrit word as part of my English speech. And in that way, I am Sanskritizing English. And the reason, and that is a kind of a revolt against the colonization by translating and mistranslating Sanskrit words. So since these words have been translated, the original has been taken over by some English substitute. Our own gurus have started using that. Our own scholars have started using those words, English words in substitutes. Our own government, our own constitution is full of that. So the, the decolonization requires also a change of vocabulary, a change of framework in which we are thinking. So for instance, uh, I'm writing a book on the Rashtra. And one of the things to describe in that uh, argue is how, why it's not the same thing as nation. The Western idea of nation has a different origin, different meaning from the, Especially in from the Hindu, uh, fr from the yeah, Hindu idea of, uh, of Rashtra. So this goes all the way. And you know, we've become so used to the westernization of uh, our way of thinking that the West therefore indirectly continues to colonize us intellectually. Thank you. Uh, Imam, uh, could you 
I had read this book a long time ago by Tariq Ali, Clash of Fundamentalisms. So he argues that the rise of Wahhabism has something directly to do with European politics and European interests. So what role does the West, so to speak, continue to play in either demonizing or actually creating chaos within Islam? Now, I have a very uh, controversial opinion on this, as all of my opinions, but this one in particular, they don't like. I respect the author who Tariq wrote that Adam. book yeah. and plenty of other authors who point the finger at the West. I think the problem is not the West, and I think the West is the solution for our issue. Maybe not for India, in fact, I would never, never support a, a Western interference in India or Hinduism. But the thing is, with Islam, it's a lot easier, and I'll tell you why. But first, let me answer the question about all the problems that we have in Wahhabism and the extreme hardline brands of Islam. Do they have anything to do with the West interfering in the Middle East? I say no. Because the ideology of Wahhabism, the same one that invaded India and invaded this entire subcontinent and butchered and killed and built mosques on top of temples and so on, there was no America, there was no Israel, there was, n there was no white man bad, no, no Donald Trump. So why do we, why do we blame them? You know. So Donald Trump, and this is where I disagree with him, Surprisingly, uh, he says Hillary founded ISIS in his campaign. If you, if you remember that, he said Hillary f founded ISIS, the mother of. No, 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 no. I think Hillary uh, funded an ideology that was already there, a hardline brand of Islam that was already there, and they allowed that to expand. And the Democrats are known for that during the time of the Soviets. They brought all these Mujahideen and, you know. So, number one, I do not think it's the West. Number two, I think this hardline brand of Islam is the same one that killed the family of the Prophet Muhammad, Imam Hussein in Karbala. Uh, the, the daughter of Muhammad was butchered. You know, they were killed, murdered, all of them. Who killed them? Muslims, killed Muslims. So the ideology was there. It's a minority, but it's a powerful minority. You know, you have the smallest terrorist organization is literally sitting on a budget because of the petrol and the oil, sitting on a budget, billions and billions of dollars. You know, and the, the smallest terrorist organization has more resources than many intelligence committees around the world put together. So. Number one, they're rich. Number two, they have existed. They're a minority. The West did nothing really to, you know, to... I know there's a concept of revenge. You come to Syria and we will fight you. You come to Iran, we'll fight you. But honestly, let's, let's look at a different angle that's been very successful. So you have petrol and oil in Muslim land. In Iraq, there's oil. Where does it go? The politicians steal it and they sell it. It's going to get stolen anyway. So whether America takes it or whether the ruler takes it, you're not going to get a drop from it. You're going to have to buy it. So Dubai and the UAE understood this concept. They said, why fight with America and say, you kafir, you're not going to get one oil. In fact, come take it, take it. And you saw now Dubai is like heaven on earth. You know, they sold it to them. When, when the West comes, to Muslim lands, especially now in modern times, you know, it's not like the, the barbaric, uh, you know, era before. And now when they come, the, the West comes in the, in the name of a company. They come in the name of uh, interior ministry, a foreign ministry. They come, uh, you know, as, as a minister to your country. And that's how they buy and, and they deal with you. The Muslim countries that dealt with the West have now the best universities, have the best intelligence services, have safety, and this is why it works in the Middle East for Muslims only. I don't think the West has anything to contribute to India. I don't think so. I think they have much to learn from India. Um, and this is coming from someone that was raised and lives in the West. But for Muslim societies, 
the West coming over, building schools, universities, uh, skyscrapers, whatever, you, it works. Or, um, look, a Muslim walking in Dubai, these skyscrapers and this infrastructure, this has a, it has an effect on how they act, on how they speak, on how they carry themselves. It, cha it shapes society in a different way. And it's also, it happens quickly. We don't have to wait a hundred years, maybe this society will change. No, Dubai 25 years ago was a desert. Now, it's developed in a way, even the people in Dubai don't believe. Like, wow, seriously, this is the, the, the country that I belong to? So, what, the West works fast, it pays, and it leaves with some damages, but, I mean, not more than the damages the Muslim communities cause for themselves anyway. Um, so my opinion is that yes, to a certain extent, no in such countries. Thank you. Do you have a question for yeah. Rajiv Ji? I have one more question first. Okay. Yeah, just one more. Uh, there's a big controversy in India concerning beef eating. The position has been taken that Muslims are required to eat beef. This is a position that has been marketed. And therefore, if Hindus, out of reverence for the cow, don't want beef eating to be so predominant, they're denying Muslims a fundamental right of their religion. But I'm also told that in, this, in the Arabian desert, cow is not a native, it's camel eating. They eat camels and goats and eat, eat other things, in which case, beef eating would not be mandatory. It would be an option. So what is your view on whether the Quran requires beef eat per se to be eaten? The Quran or the religion has nothing to do with what Muslims eat. Nothing. It doesn't say anything about what you can eat uh, when it comes to meat. Look, yes, I know the, the alcohol, the, the pork, alcohol, these things are mentioned. But this beef, onion, salad, mayonnaise, these things are not mentioned there. And they will never be mentioned, right? So I think you have some politicians, right, who know how to lie and get away with it. And because you can't read the Quran, yeah, they say, well, it's in the Quran that I have to eat cow. No, it's not in the Quran that you have to eat cow or anything. And in fact, a bit of a personal uh, case, I've been vegetarian for two years now. And uh, I've been, been very healthy, as you can see. Most of my, uh, my problems, I had problems in my gums, I had problems with my skin now. You know, things are going good. Uh, so I invite everyone else to become vegetarian. It's a lot easier. No one will force me to eat beef. And uh, let's answer the question about the reverence of the cow. Every community reveres a certain uh, God, a certain animal, a certain building, a certain teacher. I think it's very important that the minority respect what the majority believe. Because this is the case, this is the case in Muslim countries. In Muslim countries, a Hindu can't tell them what to do. A Christian can't tell them what to do because the majority have the say. And I know that's not the best way to solve societal problems based on what the majority say, but at least if that's the law that's applied in Muslim countries, then it should at least be applied in India, right? And if, if beef is, is uh, you know, it's a sacred meat, it's a, it's a sacred, uh, cow is a sacred animal and beef should not be eaten, then they have no reason to eat it, especially when there are many other options many other options you'd be surprised what some of them eat you know muslims in nigeria eat snails right there are many other options muslims can eat i don't i don't find a problem uh, in adjusting diet based on uh, you know uh, especially if it makes society a better place okay one last question and then and i could listen to you all day but i have to wrap this up so one last question would you have any question for rajiv as a hindu uh given that he asked you so many questions i think it's it's well what i'm going to say is a it's half question half suggestion i think the peace and tranquility and love and the, this this amazing hospitality that i have lived 
in the past 48 hours in India. I think this should be, in a way, presented to the West only because the belief system of this, of, of this crowd today. So I've, I've taken some courses, online courses, on the Hindu faith, and I think there's much more that, should, that could be and should be introduced to the West. I think there's a lack of understanding in the Muslim community and you know, the global community in general about what Hinduism can offer, what Hinduism is, uh, what it values, what the values of Hinduism are, and how even though India is a secular society, it has been influenced in such a great way that nobody gets beheaded because of their religion, nobody gets butchered, nobody gets stoned, thro thrown off buildings. I think there's much that the world can learn from India, and I would wonder if Dr. Rajiv and I, uh, if you would be willing uh, to uh, introduce this to the Muslim community, perhaps through conferences and events in the near future. Yes. Thank you. All right. Uh, so, questions from the audience. Uh, we are out of time, okay, apparently. Fine, fine. So, but the uh, answer is audience yes, we'll questions, Thank you. please. Uh, make your questions brief. They have to be in the form of a question and uh, not a comment. Thank you. Hello. Uh, my question is to both the panelists. Uh, many people are dying in Yemen, but uh, no one raises an uh, issue in India. And I know th there are certain reasons. Uh, my question is that how much West influences that what is written about Islam, what issue about Islam is raised and what issue is not raised, how much is West influencing that? Would you like me to the go The question yeah. is, how, what is the influence of the West in Yemen? The, the whole issue of the West in Yemen is that the West's ally, Saudi Arabia, has a problem in Yemen and they have the green light to do whatever they like because it's a neighboring country and it's a threat. That's basically it. I know there are some arms deals between these Gulf uh, states and America, but at the end of the day, you know, if Saudi Arabia buys weapons from any country and then uses it, that country is not that responsible for it, right? But because, well, now that they, they have pulled out, and the U.S. has, I think they've stopped or they pulled out just recently, a week ago, I, I saw an announcement. The answer is, it's Iran. Iran needs to stop meddling in Syria, in Lebanon, in Austria, in Europe, in Pakistan, in Palestine, in Yemen. When Iran stops, there will be no need to fight. What's happening and what the media doesn't wish to speak about is that Iran is fighting proxy wars. It's fighting Saudi Arabia in Iraq. It's fighting Saudi Arabia in Yemen. Okay, we only take a look at the, the, the attacker, right? Oh, what's happening? Well, where do the, these Houthis get their weapons from? Who is giving it to them? It's Iran. So we need to be very fair and balanced. One side is attacking, and the other side is also responsible to some degree. I am absolutely against the children being killed, the school buses being attacked, and the problem with the West is that they don't know how to frame it. The West do doesn't know who the bad guy is. Because Saudi Arabia isn't the good guy in America. But he's, they're an ally, but they don't know how to frame it. If it's Israel, then they know who the bad guy is. It's the person attacking Israel immediately. But because we don't know who the bad guy is in the West, we can't frame it. And because they don't frame it, then they can't speak about it. I am absolutely against the war in Yemen. But if we're going to point fingers, we need to point fingers in the right direction. OK. Two more questions. Yes. Hello, sir. Uh, my question is uh, to Imam. Uh, We've been hearing this a lot uh, in recent times uh, with all the political correctness that uh, if you say uh, just something as trivial as uh, Muslim extremism exists, it only helps in radicalizing more Muslims. Uh, how much of it is true and should we not be saying it at all? Or, uh, so what's your point on that? So if I told you that you have a flu, will you have a flu? It doesn't work. So if I say someone is an extremist, will they be an extremist? No, unless he really is an extremist. 
So if someone is an extremist, and you call them an extremist, and they react in an extreme way, then they're proving your point. But just because us saying there are extremist Muslims, it doesn't make them extreme if they're not extreme. I don't know, did you get my point? Next question, please. Shall I? Uh, my question is to Imam Sahab. Uh, uh, since you represent a Shiite thought, whenever it comes to Islamic uh, radicalization, you always talk about uh, Saudi Arabia and Sunnism. Why don't you talk to reform first Hezbollah or Iran? That's my first question. I think I've mentioned Iran 10 times now. Um, that's one. And Iran basically means Hezbollah because I said Lebanon, meddling Lebanon. Um, and my book has an entire chapter on Shia Islam and Shia Islamic governance. And to conclude, I studied in Iran as of 2007. Before that, and since 1995, I was raised in private Muslim Sunni schools. So I've been trained by both Sunni and Shia. My book speaks about both. I'm not a sectarian. I work with Shias and I work with Sunnis against extremists, Shia and Sunnis. In fact, that's one thing that nobody can ever accuse me of, and that's being sectarian. Because throughout all my speeches, if I mention Saudi Arabia, I never fail to mention Iran. Uh, I always maintain a balance, and you saw that here today. So I think the brother should uh, listen more or get a copy of my book. Next question. And I'll sign up for you. Assalamu alaikum, Imam. Uh, well, actually, you said uh, that there is no need of reformation from upside. Uh, but uh, I would like to argue about um, the reformation that has been said um, in the Surah Juma when it was revealed that there will be a reformation in the later times. The Imam, the coming of the Imam Mahdi. What is your view on that? And the second question I would, uh, there is not a question I would like to point out it. You said about the uh, in Islam there is a love for the Islam only, but it's not true. Uh, there is a saying of Prophet, and I quote. Love for one's nation is a part of faith. Thanks. The uh, question regarding reformation in the end of time. Most Abrahamic religions believe that towards the end of time there will be a savior who comes and will save the earth. The, the Christians call it the second coming, some of them. And the Muslims also believe that there will be a descendant from the family of Muhammad. Along with Jesus Christ, that will emerge in the end of time and then the, you know, the end of time and the occurrences there will take place and those who believe in them will be saved. Every religion has its own philosophy when, when it discusses the end of time. That's not reformation. I'll tell you why. Because when they approach, when a savior approaches, do you think they will agree with what Iran is doing? Or will they want to wipe out that constitution and write a better one? What's the point in, in a savior if he's going to do the same thing? What's the point? I don't want the savior to reform anything. I want him to bring something new. Something that's going to work. We're reforming what we have because it doesn't work. So if he wants to reform something, that doesn't, I don't want that. Logically speaking, it has to be something that's new, that's fresh, that understands our societal problems and provides solutions for them. As for the verses of love, there are many verses of love. The problem is, do they love? There are many hadiths of love. Do they love? Well, if they do, then you're living in a wonderful area. Maybe I should move next door. I have a scar on my forehead because people don't love. I have bodyguards, look at them. All this security because people can't love. Right? So I think it's, it's very easy to say we love and, you know, but if you don't love me, for criticizing you just a little bit, and I'm one of you, death threats come, then that's not definition. That's some really weird love there. I don't know what kind of love Are that is. Are there any short questions? Anyone? Yeah, uh, hello. My question is to the Imam. And you talked about the interpretation of the Quran in different cultures. And uh, what my question is, most people, most Muslims in India, like Mulanas and Imams, they say that the Quran is the word of God, and it cannot be interpreted. 
and they specifically the principle principle of Quranic abrogation and they talk about the kafir and everything and the example is that where I come from uh, Kashmir where uh, you can argue that uh, the place was uh, Hindu majority but now it's Muslim and the history and where a specific population was Wahhabis through, throughout the history so how do you suggest that we protect uh, peaceful Muslim populations against Wahhabism my position on the Kashmir issue is very uh very clear. I'm not a politician. I only care about history and religion. I know that Islam came to India much later than Hinduism. It had already existed. Pakistan claimed independence way after all this happened, 70 years ago. So I don't see that Pakistan is a suitable uh, negotiator regarding Kashmir. I don't think they even have the right to speak. Um, I, I believe it's Hindu land. That's very controversial. Many will say no. They have the right to have their opinions. My position is that Kashmir is Hindu land. And I say this in front of everyone. In front of everyone. I'm not just saying this because I'm in India. I've said this. This has been my opinion for five years. Even when I was an extremist, this was my opinion. So nobody can say that I'm being paid by Modi or anything like that. Uh, now, uh, to answer your question about uh, interpretation, that's not true. That is not true because these very Molanas, they will have laws about Facebook, about satellites, about the internet. Where did they get them from? From the Quran. Then you interpreted some verse about not looking at, uh, uh, for example, a naked lady, right? And you form these laws that have to do with viewing television, viewing certain issues on the internet. So. It's impossible that you deal with banks, you deal with, uh, you know, just regular society, with universities, with that interpretation. So to say that we're just interpreting, they either live in a cave, that they don't need to interpret anything, or they're lying to you. Okay. Uh, one last question. Is this me? Go ahead. Yeah, actually, uh, my, my question uh, is... No, uh, I want to take her question because we, we want some women speaking up as well. Go ahead. That's high expectations. If I can say Allahu Akbar, can you say Bharat Mata Ki Jai? How do I say it? Bharat Mata Ki Jai. Bharat Mata Ki Jai. Thank you. So, so, so well, what does that mean? Let me translate. She said, uh, glory to Mother India. Okay, so you said Allahu Akbar. Is there a boom here now? There's no boom after that. <laughs> You're my security, you guys ready? Just in case. Okay. I, uh, do I have time for uh, more questions? No. I unfortunately have no more time for questions. I have to... First, does Modi give out money? Uh, I have no experience. You, we have to talk. <laughs> all right. Uh, so thank you all for coming and witnessing this wonderful opening thank of you. a dialogue. Thank you for having us. And it goes to show that beyond the power-hungry politicians, beyond the academics, a, a, a real dialogue is possible because we are all human beings. We all love each other, and we all want peace. So I thank the Imam for bringing that message to us today. I thank uh, Rajivji for uh, asking the tough questions as, as, as one says it, very tough questions. I would not have brought up the beef question, but, just, but I appreciate that you did. So thank you, everyone. One loud applause for everyone.